pleasure that not everybody gets, but I can tell you that it is a huge pleasure for me. I get to announce and introduce the speaker today, and I'll go through it as quickly as I can so we can get right to her. Elizabeth Allison Streeter was born in Livermore on May 6, 1968. She answered her parents and her brother's wishes by being a girl. As she puts it, she grew up in the wilds of Northern California amongst cows, wineries, and physicists. And on a steady diet of Star Trek, The Muppet Show, Atari, and musical rehearsals in her liver family's living room, often, let me tell you, very often, she started drawing as soon as she could hold a writing implement and started writing as soon as she had something to say, which was when she was very, very young. <laughs> She attended Stanford University, took part in the Stanford Overseas Studies program, and spent a quarter in Tour France. Graduated in 1989 with dual bachelors in studio art and communication. Uh, she wore a fish on her head so we could quickly identify her from the other graduates. <laughs> as an aside, we were surprised when she registered at Stanford as an art major. Against all obvious indications of the direction she was taking with her life, we thought she was going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> she can explain the infield fly rule and once devised a way to score infinite points on space invaders for the Atari. She has worked in film and video production, design and video games, and has served as president of Community Theater. She is cartoonist in residence at the Charles M. Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, a cartoonist in residence at the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco, and a member of the California Shakespeare Theater Board of Directors. She and her family are voracious consumers of books, music, movies, art, action figures, and musical instruments, resulting in inadequate storage space. She lives in Lafayette with her husband, son, daughter, two peculiar disruptive cats, and a mellow but hungry tarantula. All four of them are Paul Harris fellows, by the way. Um, she also has an author's page on Amazon where you can see a variety of her publications. If I share with you all of her artistic and literary experiences and accomplishments, there will be no time left for her presentation. So please, give a rotary welcome to my daughter, Betsy Streeter. Fun to be right, and it's so late, you know. And we have a whole TV 
networks dedicated to telling different parts of our society how right they are. Right? So if you watch this channel over here, you're going to hear this particular kind of right. And over here, you're going to hear some other kind of right. And if you see a poll that you agree with, you go, see? See? And if you see a poll that you disagree with, you go, what is this world coming to? <laughs> The, the country is going down the tubes. I mean, it's been going down the tubes since it was founded. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's been going down since we started. So, so this is one kind of story, but I wanted, this is kind of 50% of my topic, because what I wanted to say is, this is one kind of story. We tell ourselves stories so that we know who we are, right, and how we fit into the world, and how we identify with um, the people around us, and the country we're from, and whatever other affiliations we might have. But there's another kind of story, that I want to tell you about, and that is about um, the unexpected. Why is this not? Oops, we need to go back one. Are you doing that? Yeah. <laughs> that one. Okay. And that story is about things that um, we didn't know, we had no idea existed, and then make us a bigger person as a result. And as a storyteller, I just thought I'd share with you a few quick stories about things that have happened to me as a storyteller that I never, ever, ever, ever could have predicted were going to occur. This cartoon came out in syndication, so a lot of people saw it, and it was, I got it from, I walked past the biography section of the bookstore, and, and at the time there was a uh, biography out of J. Edgar Hoover. And so the, the, the cross-dressers uh, <laughs> bit up there was an oblique reference to what was in that book. And that was amusing to me, and I put it, and it was fine. And then I got some emails, and I got some, and these people have, we talked about words earlier, these people had some words for me, and these people were cross-dressers, okay, and they were mad. They didn't think this was funny at all, and they felt like, once again, they were being used as society's punching bag. And so I had this back and forth with these people, and there were the, the younger, angrier ones, and then eventually this kind of older guy got on that was kind of almost like their, I don't, I don't want to say den mother, but kind of like their, their leader, and he was much more measured in his response, and he said, look, this is what we're going to do. We have a message board, and we're going to give you a temporary login to this message board, and we're going to tell everybody you're there, and you can come in and you can read what we say to each other. And I said, okay. And they said, you're going to take you off in like a week, so like get on there and put it. And I said, all right. And then I got on, I got my login, and I went in, and they said, and you know, you can see the announcement, okay, we have a guest here, everybody, <laughs> everybody behave, or whatever. And I went in and I read their, their message board, and it was the most mundane thing you've ever seen, because these people had all accepted each other. Right? They weren't there having a party and they weren't there talking about how amazing it was that they No, they were talking about the logistics of living a double life. Right? What do you do when somebody comes home earlier than you thought? How do you layer your clothes so that you can quickly look back the way you're supposed to? These were people who were literally two people, right? And they had all this strategy and technique associated with that. You would never ever, I, I mean, these, these people by definition are not findable, right? I can't go out and knock on doors and say, I would like to speak to some press dressers with this. They're, they're not, that's not, they're, they're by definition not people that you're going to know about, right? The only reason that I knew about them and, because, and, 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 and had any idea they existed and that they had these kinds of conversations at all was because this person invited me in. And it was because I didn't flame them back, right? I was like, well, that's interesting. And we went back and forth. And that's actually been my philosophy whenever this kind of thing happens, is to go, well, that's interesting. <laughs> what is this? So then we went by and I went on. Anyway, I ended up um, changing the cartoon to say didn't use turn signal. Yeah. Because to me, it wasn't a big deal. I didn't get all righteous. But this is my First Amendment rights. And you can't tell me what they you know, I didn't care. I mean, the joke works. It's, you know, it's fine. But that was, that was, I was completely outside of what I expected. Now, as a peace offering to this group, I sent them this cartoon, which is, I had to talk to him because I can't live a lie anymore, mom, dad, I'm a cat. <laughs> okay. And I sent this to them kind of as a little something for you that, you know, and they thought this was hilarious. They loved this. And they said, thank you. And they said, we'd see, but the, the dead mother guy was like, well, if we'd seen this one first, you know, we probably would have been so hard on you. But then we ended up, you know, kind of friends and stuff. But, you know. So this, this cartoon 
also someone wrote me and said, this is my favorite cartoon ever. I used it as a humorous way to come out to my family. So, you know, okay. I, I had no idea. I mean, when you make work and it goes out into the world, it has its own life. And you don't know what it's going to do or how it's going to affect people. But that was, that was a good one. The other, the other little story I shared with them, I'm going to now here on the I'm sorry. <laughs> is this my neighbor that you need on the birthday card? Susan, yes. This one, okay, it's a Doc P cartoon, okay? It's about Doc P. So, and this one got featured really prominently in this newspaper in Virginia because I was new in their, in their paper, and so they put it in color and this huge And what happened was, um, this, which I'll read to you because I know it's hard to see, but I got this thing about how this, anyone who thinks that cartoon is funny has a very sick sense of humor, plus giving kids the idea of doing this to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go, here we go with the poll numbers, right? Our country has seen such a world decline during the past years, and this is just another way to go lower. Where has common decency gone? <laughs> see, this is when you say poll, you know, we agree with, you're like, where is this country going? And then finally, something about did Christ die on the cross so we can print filth now in our newspaper. Anyway, so, you know, again, what year two, was this? this was around 2007, I want to say, was when this particular thing happened. But again, that's interesting, right? <laughs> She can say whatever she wants. And I had a really fun back and forth with my editor with this. He's like, this is what makes life fun, and this is what makes being an editor fun. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I write science fiction. And science fiction is all about asking what if, right? Gene Roddenberry asked what if and created Star Trek. Right? Did you know that he survived three plane crashes? Whoa. Gene Roddenberry, what is that? How do you, I mean, okay. Anyway, you can look it up. Um, <laughs> Anyway, science fiction is about imagining things that you can't see in front of you, but maybe that are based on real scientific principles, or that are based on aspects of society that you can see, that you take them and you extend them and see what happens. So I write a whole story called Neptune Road, which is about Earth scientists having made Neptune a habitable planet, having given it, given it a core and a surface, and now people are, anybody who doesn't want to be on Earth is moving to Neptune. So you can imagine the mix of people you end up with. Right? It's like Australia or something. <laughs> right? All, the, 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 all these people that, that have some reason that they don't want to be on Earth are going to Neptune, and then I get to imagine what that might be like. And I have these interesting rules, like everybody eats is one of the rules. Everybody eats. So there could be a huge knockdown, drag out fight going on, and then the food truck pulls up and everybody stops and eats. Like, there's just weird things like that that I get to make up. Right? Well, at its root, Neptune Road is an immigration story, okay? It's about what it is like to leave behind where you were and go somewhere. And, and, and an immigration story is also very closely tied to the Western genre, right? Which is where people go out into an unforgiving landscape and try to make their way and deal with one another, right? With all of these clashing sets of values and the dude rides and rides into the town and the black horse and it's awesome. <laughs> All that. Okay, so so I'm very into westerns, very into this. And, and growing up in California, the immigration story is kind of woven into everything, right? It's just part of what California is. Everybody's from somewhere else, except for apparently me and my family. <laughs> um, my kids are sixth generation Californians, so um, we feel so special. So anyway, but here's part of where that came from. This is another unexpected story. So a number of years ago, I was asked to go to uh, Philip and Sally Burton High School, which is in the southern part of San Francisco, um, around Silver Avenue down there. And uh, work with these kids, a uh, class, as a journalism class, on writing cartoons about their immigration experience. So, so fun fact about the class was they were 100% English as a second language and 100% from somewhere else, okay? Every kid in the class. And so my job was to go in there and say, Hi, I'm going to show you how to make a comic because their teacher was really into comics, and then you guys are going to write and you picked, you're going to write about your story coming to this country. So I went in and I talked to them a lot. This girl had so many questions. She she was awesome. And this kid here was hilarious. I mean, they were all they were all fantastic. But I, you know, I showed them how to do a comic, and then I left. And then my job was to come back a couple weeks later and see what they did. And I walked in, and what was fascinating to me, again, extremely unexpected was the consistency of their stories. 
every one of them had an airplane or an airport or a map in it. Because there's a universality, apparently, to the human experience of moving part of your family to another part of the world, and it has to do with sitting the kids down and showing them a map of where they're going. Right? We live here, we're going here. That was huge, so they could, they could all recre recreate the map that they saw. Because this stuff is burned into their head. And many, many of them drew airports. One of them drew a picture of her having her picture taken with her at the airport and a picture of her on the airplane with the picture with her friend. Um, a lot of these families were splitting in two at that point. So one parent staying behind with one kid and the other kid and the other parent were going. So that was a huge trauma for them. One kid's mom didn't recognize him when she saw him because it had been seven years, right? And so they all had this. There was only one that was slightly different, and that was the kid who said, and then it was time to cross the border, and so we laid down in the stream bed, and I got sand in my pants. <laughs> and it was like, okay, there's no airplanes involved in that. But, I mean, he was, he was able to get that down on paper. I mean, can you imagine the cathartic aspect of doing that? really expressing that. So, so I was really stunned. They, uh, they put them all up at uh, the Yerba Buena Art Center. There was an exhibit. And you can actually see here a little bit, something like, here's this all airplane, this is an airport. Um, there were like, there was a whole wall of these. And here's a, a map, you know. So they're all, they're all coming back to these same things. That is when their life totally changed. Um, and I, I did not expect that either. Um, so, so back to our, <laughs> this is another one of my very most published cartoons. It says, the world would be a better place if everybody just thought the way I do. Um, this is where I think we sit right now. We're in kind of a scary state currently, where there's a lot of random violence going on. A lot of things where, where there's a temptation to categorize people and to see them in groups and to not necessarily appreciate their individual stories maybe as much as we normally would because we're scared. Right, and this is that this is that impulse, right? That, that notion of um, I see a poll number, I see something in the media that I agree with or don't agree with, or I characterize things based on what they sort of group into because that's what fear does. It makes people group things and try to simplify. We're trying to simplify. We're trying to understand what's going on. Um, and I'm here to say that you know where where I sit. Um, everything that I've done in my career, writing science fiction, writing comics, putting things in front of people that don't even, I mean, with the, com with the comic project, I mean, the kids who, you know, they, their language does not go left to right and top to bottom, okay? So we have to figure out how they could write comics, right? So I would encourage everyone to try to go this direction. Every year, I republish this drawing. <laughs> every year. And every year, there's a new reason for it to be important. This is something that I drew sitting in my bed one night. I mean, you can tell it's kind of casually drawn. It's not super, there's not a lot of technique or anything. I just was like, oh, this is interesting. And it, this is another thing that got up and went out and got a life of its own without me and ended up on the cover of the Funny Times and a bunch of other places. And every year, I put it back up and I go, here's this. <laughs> Again, I mean, the year of Sandy Hook happened, this was very hard. This year it's hard because I've spent a lot of time in Paris, but it's just here it is again. <laughs> and so that's what I offer you to you today is that sense of you know maybe this is a time when what we really should be doing is finding as many ways as possible to grow, finding things we don't understand that sound funny, that look funny, that we've never seen before, and go find those things and, and resist that impulse to say you know the world would be a better place if everybody just thought the way I do. So. So that's my second to last slide. This is my this is my last slide. <laughs> because it's my dad's birthday today. Yeah. He's right there. <laughs>
I mean, the question I have for you is, what is your life like? Do you have a daily schedule? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're writing, drawing, creative, uh, publishing, etc. Life. What do you are you? Do you have a regular practice? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a weird mix of extremes because writing you spend a lot of time by yourself, and then suddenly you're here. Like that's how it works. So I'll be like at Comic Con, and then the next week I'm like face down in front of the computer, type, 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 type for days at a time, and then I'm here, you know. And so it's kind of it's kind of like that. But there's a lot of I just voraciously consume everything I possibly can because, like I said, it all goes into the stories. You know, people don't want to read about a character that's a category. You know, a Pakistani cat lady who collects bottle caps is interesting, right? So, you know, that's interesting, but you got to go find those bits, and so there's a lot of scavenging around a lot, looking at art, a lot of music, a lot of music. So, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>